Hey, how's it going, folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. Today, we're looking at one you guys have been wanting me to cover for a long time. Session 9, where tensions arise within an asbestos cleaning crew as they work in an abandoned mental hospital with a horrific past that seems to be coming back. This one has been kind of an underappreciated cult classic since its release nearly 20 years ago, but I was pleasantly surprised when re-watching it for this video that it actually holds up really well, and there's a lot that really works about it. First of all, the atmosphere is spot on, and the abandoned hospital makes things full of dread the entire time, thanks in no small part to them using a real abandoned hospital, and even just use all the crap that was still left around for the scenes. Very easy set dressing. Nice. Another big part of this that works is the very naturalistic and believable chemistry between our main group of guys. They all have an amusing kind of bickering and joking nature, and all the characters come across feeling very real. The perhaps most notable amongst the cast is David Caruso. Sure, he's always a bit over the top, but that actually works for the movie. And he does have one amazingly super line delivery during an argument. No, fuck you! There's also Joss Lucas in there playing against type as kind of a jerk ass, and I barely recognized him in the role. I kept being like, yo, is that Joss Lucas? I can't tell with that killer stash. Any uh, Sweet Home Alabama fans out there? Just kidding. But this really is Peter Mullen as Gordon's movie. The entire setup about getting into his head and how as soon as he enters the hospital, it seems that he's beginning to suffer a psychotic break but is there something supernatural behind it? That's the big question of the movie. So let's pay a visit to the Danvers Psychiatric Hospital and get to work with session nine, breaking down the story, including the important patient Mary and her sessions, as well as explaining the ending that ties everything together. We open with asbestos removal business partners, Gordon and Phil, waiting to enter the premises of the rundown Danvers Psychiatric Hospital. While Phil is upbeat, flipping through radio stations, Gordon, as Phil points out, looks tired and beat, explaining that his daughter still has her ear infection. And asking about how his wife is, he says Wendy is just as tired as he is. Phil kindly offers to help any way he can, as a security guy lets them in and presents some history of the place, learning that it closed back in 1985. And a lot of patients wound up just let into the streets when the place closed down. And some even still try to get back into the hospital so many years later, along with a problem with punk kids that come in and deface the walls with graffiti. The two discuss their plan of how to pitch themselves for their job, knowing that other companies have already been out here with a fast and low offer. Phil saying that he likes fast too, but Gordy prefers safe. They arrive at the front and are taken aback by just how massive the place is, and the mayor guy gives them a tour of the antiquated facilities. Phil disturbed by a room used for hydrotherapy, the guy chiming in that they did lobotomies here. Wanting to stick to seeing the problem areas, they enter the mess hall and instantly notice that the tiles are are filled with dangerous asbestos, learning the hospital is to be repurposed for the town's use. He describes the design of the building being like a bat, with a main hub and wings that stretch out into four different wards, the farthest away ward being known as the Snake Pit, lovely name, and it is where they hosted the most dangerous patients, the idea being to keep them as far away as possible from everyone else. Gordy peers down a long corridor, seeing an old wheelchair there. Suddenly, there is a crackling sound, accompanied by an odd and very distinct man's voice telling him, Hello, Gordon. Hello, Gordon. Make sure to pay attention to that, and he gets snapped back to reality by Phil. Delving deeper into the hospital, they find more and more areas in need of total decontamination, and ducts that need to be stripped. The guy just wants to know how long it would take, Phil suggesting three weeks, but Gordy butts in that they can do it in two. When asked what it is, he's steadfast that they only need two. Coming to a patient's room, which they called seclusions back in the day, Phil sees the wall lined with cutouts and pictures, informing him it was a big thing in the 70s, a kind of art therapy to help with patient self-esteem. After looking over the photos, he asks what was wrong with this one, but the guy doesn't know. And this actually is Mary's room, who becomes very important. Outside, Phil forgot his tool bag going back inside to fetch it, and the guy congratulates Gordy on his daughter, knowing they've been trying for a long time. He's got his mind on the money, now saying he can do the whole job in one week. The guy is dubious, saying, well, that's fast, but Gordy tries to convince him that he's good for it, pleading that he needs 
needs a job. Later, having landed the job, he flips through pictures of his baby, seeing Wendy, his wife, holding their child. She notices him and takes the girl inside. Heaving a big, languished sigh, he collects his stuff, including flowers, to celebrate. As he enters, the sound turns echoey, not seeing what happens, but hearing Wendy excited about the flowers, then a blood-curdling scream, and well, that's usually not good. The mystery of what happened here becoming a huge part of our story overall. The next day, they get to work, joined by the rest of their crew, like Hank, who is now sleeping with Phil's ex-wife, which is pretty awkward, leading to the two constantly giving each other shit, along with the brightest in the bunch, almost lawyer Mike, along with Gordy's nephew, the slickly mulleted greenhorn Jeff, who is kind of a moron. Mike chides him for putting on heavy metal music, as the vibrations will stir up the dangerous asbestos particles in the air and go right into his lungs, which is obviously dangerous. At lunch, Hank is happy with their seemingly perfect gig, telling him he should be grateful they're going to earn good money, 10 k a piece. That is pretty good. He immediately asks what the catch is, and that's the wrinkle. They have to do the whole job in just seven days. Hank bugged as it's at least a two week job, them getting into it again. The security guard shows up with keys for them, asking why the hospital closed down, bemusing about budget cuts in the 80s. But Mike knows about another story tied to the Danvers hospital that is much more alarming. He tells the tale of one patient there, Patricia Willard, and the doctors utilize a new technique to release hidden or repressed memories. This led to Patricia giving a grandiose story about her whole family abusing her and being part of some weird satanic cult, but they found out later that it never actually happened. The family countersued and won, so that plus budget cuts and poof, no more Danvers. After this disturbing story, Hank gives him shit about not becoming a lawyer, ribbing him about being on a one-year plan, while Phil is already sick of Hank, wanting to replace him with a guy he met from a competing company, as he's more experienced. But Gordy is steadfast in keeping him, certain that he's not a liability. Jeff the dumbass is playing around on a tile removal machine and ends up messing it up almost instantly. Mike orders him to check on the breaker box, but he says he's scared of the dark and annoyed Mike going to check it himself, joking to Jeff to not break anything while he's gone. Good luck with that. Downstairs, he plugs the cord back in, turning on the lights in the room, seeing behind him what looks like a file room coming to a door marked staff only. Fiddling with some of the piles of boxes in the room, the light fades out, then back in in a distinct way to seemingly alert Mike to look in one particular box. He takes it down and cuts the top with a knife. At that moment, Gordy accidentally cuts his hand, hearing a scream and glass shattering, as Hank gets some asbestos dust in his eyes, as though opening the box has some kind of grander implication, which it certainly does. Wrapping up for the day, Mike says he needs another hour, Gordy telling him to get out by dark, leaving him all alone in the spooky building as night falls. He sticks around to investigate what he discovered in the box marked as evidence, several reel-to-reel -reel tapes that tell the story of patient Mary Hobbs. Sticking on session number one. Can you guess how many there are in total? Yup, nine. Good job, you're paying attention. The main crux of the sessions is to use that repressed memory therapy to help Mary come to terms with an incident that occurred 22 years ago on Christmas night in Lowell. She cries. Nothing happened. The doc saying something did. That's why we're having these sessions. To remember. And suddenly her voice changes to that of a child. Mike noticing that she has other aliases like Billy and Princess, most likely suffering from dissociative identity disorder, different personalities within Mary. And she has switched to the innocent Princess one now. She reveals that Mary got a pretty China doll, while her brother Peter got a big old knife. Remembering Peter along with Billy and Princess played hide and seek. The doc asks if Billy told her what happened, but she says that he only tells her nice things. He asks if another personality, Simon, was there, but she shuts him down, saying she doesn't know who that is and complains of being tired. And Gordon is back outside his house with a stain on his pants. He groans, seeing a white floral thing on his rearview mirror as the work continues on to Tuesday. They cart out the toxic ceiling tiles, the area now completely wrapped in plastic. On his own, Gordon looks out the window, seeing a gazebo adorned with crosses. The same garbled man's voice comes through, saying, You can hear me. In another area, Jeff passes by, Mike instructing him to put on a mask, retorting back, No way, princess, leaving Mike dumbfounded, as we know princess is one of Mary's personalities. Hank is busy spraying down the pipes and comes 
across a coin on the ground from all the way back in 1884, then finds another. Hank getting excited now. More magic old coins, please! Approaching a wall, he sees more treasure buried behind the bricks. His looting is halted by Gordon telling him to come up and get his gear ready. He's like, uh, fine, but what about the treasure? For now, he stuffs it all back in the wall, seeing it's on the other side of the furnace connected to the morgue, meaning this all came from people that were burned in the furnace, only these belongings being left behind. Which to me, considering that, is probably in his best interest to let this stuff be. It's lunchtime, courtesy of Gordon, asking where Mike is. He's told that he's looking for some missing equipment, annoying Gordon as he doesn't want anyone wandering around on their own. Naturally, Mike is delving into further sessions, now on number five. Mary regresses further, and Billy comes out, the doctor asking where the personalities live. The princess in the tongue, because she's always talking. Billy in the eyes, because he sees everything. What about Simon, he asks, the recording cutting out abruptly with no answer. What's up with this Simon guy? That's probably the key to everything. It is. Dumbo Jeff is looking through an old record book, cackling that three people were committed due to mortified pride, showing how much of an easy catch-all throwing people in a place like this used to be, as Mike comes back lamenting that he couldn't find the cartridges. They consider how someone would get committed nowadays, as if you kill someone you go to jail, right? But Hank brings up John Hinckley, who was ruled to have been temporarily insane, winding up in a nut house, but not jail. Mike corrects that that usually doesn't work, as homicide implies a motive. Jeff giggles, what are you, a lobotomy case? Taking some of his drink and pretending to foam at the mouth. Mike violently grabs him, sticking a chopstick right up to his eyes, detailing how he could jam it in at just the right spot, and it wouldn't actually kill him. In a similar fashion to how lobotomies were done back in the day, the only prescribed cure, they say, sunglasses, of course. But relents saying that he's just messing around, but definitely gave Jeff a pretty good scare. Sort of seems like the tapes are starting to get to Mike in a way. Hank takes another break, leaving him with Jeff, and it seems that he's hopeful of becoming some kind of big time gambler. And Jeff is confused about the point just to have an exit plan, Hank says. If you stick with this job too long, it'll mess you up. The stress getting inside of you. Picking up one piece of the tainted tile, he gravely states this could already be in your lung tissue, and it grows around it like a time bomb. By the time you're 30, you'd be drowning in your own fluid, which sounds lovely. Still confused, he asked why he's not wearing a mask if it's so dangerous, but that's because Hank's got his own exit plan, just like Mikey who is intending on going back to law school, seeing him back with the tapes. Nearby, a strange shot of a bundle of roses covered in the solution they use to disinfect, seeming to symbolize blood spilling onto the flowers, the same kind that Gordon brought to his wife. He goes on that Phil has an exit plan too, just leaving poor Gordon. For him, he has no other choice, but deems him a Zen master of calm, as Hank has never seen him lose it. But he is growing worried, seeing some cracks starting to show in the past few months. Jeff excuses, well, he's got a new kid and everything, but from Hank's perspective, while obviously stressful, having a child should be the joy of his life, and it simply isn't. Gordon alone makes a phone call to Wendy, saying they need to talk, but their conversation is lost over the noise of the generator until she seemingly hangs up on him. Back at the window, he sees some shady looking characters meeting with Phil, handing over some cash and getting something in return. Hmm, what's he up to? That night, Hank returns under the cover of darkness to collect his loot, snatching up all the coins and other jewelry he can get his mitts on, including a little bag with glass eyeballs, smiling, they've gotta be worth something. He hears a rustling sound, but thinks nothing of it, digging even deeper into the wall and finding a lobotomy needle, impressed and wondering what it is. He enters an area flanked with a row of cages, startled by more noises behind him, and growing more terrified, spots a shadowy figure emerging at the end of the hall, sending him hightailing it out of there. He gets spooked by some birds and tries to calm himself down. He comes to a corner marked exit, and gasps when rounding it. Without seeing his fate, we move to Wednesday, where there they're still working on the dang ceiling tiles while Mike tears up the floors, but there's no sign of Hank. They all try to get a hold of him, but no dice suggesting to call Amy. As we know, Phil's ex-wife that Hank is now dating. Annoyed, he offers to make the call since he knows her number, and he's about to speak, but she cuts him off. Him confused, asking when did this happen? He hangs up, relaying that he went to her house last night and packed up his car, saying he found his meal ticket and bolted to Miami for casino school, whatever the heck that is. Phil 
now feels vindicated about Hank's reliability, but Gordon is confused, saying that he just went without saying anything? Phil thinks it's a blessing to replace him considering their tight deadline, but Gordon feels that something isn't right, asking about those two guys Phil was talking with. He keeps prodding him and things get tense, Phil walking away and muttering to call McManus. Gordon gets pissed, spewing to never walk away from me, and Phil goads him like, are you gonna hit me or what? And Gordon scurries off. He takes a seat on the stairs that leads to Ward A, or the most dangerous ward as we remember, and see that his fingernails are bleeding to his shock. Mike and Phil lament how things have been on a downward slope for the company since Emma was born, blaming this for losing their last two gigs. They believe having a kid wasn't in Gordon's heart, and it was his wife who really wanted a child. Starting to get it where all the stress is coming from, Gordon. Why are you losing your shit, dude? But people change, Mike offers, both at least agreeing Hank should have been fired months ago. Later, Mike digs through the file cabinets, finding Mary's file, marked deceased, on the front, along with her patient number 444, while Gordon goes to the patient's graveyard outside to try to call Wendy again, asking if she can ever forgive him. Seeing he's sitting right by the marker for Mary's, right there, it's number 444, and it's actually broken. It's like Mary's starting to seep in. Gordon, seep, seep, seep. Mike puts on another session, Mary crying that she misses her family. The doc asks about the scars on her chest, saying she got them when falling off of her bike. They ask about her other personalities, but she says she doesn't know who any of them are, seeing in her file photo that she does have scars on her chest, so she wasn't making them up, I guess. Billy takes over, again asking about that night. She starts tearing up, the doctor urging that she must wake up Simon. Phil and Gordon are left alone at the end of another hard day. Phil is fresh from the shower, and tells an extremely weary looking Gordon to take one too, as he doesn't want to keep that hazardous shit all over him. He asks Phil what the stupidest thing that he ever done was, and he jokes, well, beside working for you, introducing Hank to Amy. He stammers, wishing that he could take that back. Gordon reveals that he hit Wendy, that after the first day of work on Friday, he went home with flowers and champagne to celebrate, that moment we saw with him in the car outside of his house. He said that he wanted to kiss her, but she turned around and before he knew it, a pot of boiling water was spilled all over his leg. He languishes, he wasn't sure if it was a dog barking or Emma crying or what, but he lost it and slapped her. He's worried because he does love her, but even though it was an accident, knows that he did hurt her. He says that he's been staying in a hotel and asks him not to tell the others. He also relents to bringing in a replacement member, just as he suggested. Phil is apparently feeling open too, explaining those kids that he saw him with were responsible for some graffiti, saying that it's taken care of now. Later, Gordon is asleep, and the scratchy voice returns telling him hello, and flashing back to him outside the house, seeing the pot ominously sitting there on boil, the voice asking if he knows who they are, and giggles. He has a weird vision of him in a dark space, wearing his hazmat suit, the voice telling him to do it, do it hearing boy. the slap, and his suit is then covered in blood, all of this making it sound like it was this voice that actually caused him to harm his wife. He wakes up groaning, seeing some pretty bad boils on his legs, thanks to the hot water incident, and pours some distance infectant on it that looks like it hurts like a son of a bitch. And obviously he's been sleeping outside in his truck at the hospital rather than at a motel as he told Phil. We then float through the hospital, stopping on the wheelchair, a shadow seen passing by on the other side of the wall. Thursday morning, Phil is by himself and rolls a joint, which actually must have been what he got from those boys. Just as Gordon drives up in the van, giving him a limp, hey, surprise he's up so early. And Gordy is looking beaten down, getting misty-eyed, saying that he wants to go home. Yikes, it's plain to see Gordon's guilt has sent him deep into a mental breakdown, along with all the stress has basically crumbled him. Phil goes to the roof to finish his dube, chuckling it's about to get ugly. Power struggle! No one's stronger than David Caruso. I'm the leader. I am a Miami boy. Mike is brought along by Phil asking him to come with him and expresses concern over Gordon's mental state, feeling that he needs some time off and that he is becoming a liability. Mike understands and he spills that he hit his wife, all overheard by an eavesdropping Gordon, going on about how they're worried about losing the big bonus and everything because if they don't take action, that's what's gonna happen. He tells Mike to follow his lead, declaring himself officially in charge now as Gordon approaches to their surprise. They lie that they were just talking about Jeff's performance and that he's doing a bang up job. Elsewhere, Jeff plugs the line back in and shockingly finds the long missing Hank, staring blankly out of the window and wearing sunglasses. He tells him he's in some deep shit with Gordon and Phil, asking what he's doing here. He says nothing, running his finger down the glass, leaving a blood trail behind. Oh, uh, well yeah, uh, something is definitely off about Hank now. He runs to tell the others the news. Of course, they don't believe him, thinking he's an idiot, as he's supposed to be 
be in Miami, which starts to churn in Gordon's mind. They were only told by Phil he left after talking to his ex, but no one actually heard what she said on the call, or if he even called her at all. Phil tries to play this into what he was saying to Mike about his state of mind, turning intense when Gordon asked to speak to Amy himself. Suddenly hearing footsteps above, they decide to check it out just in case. The group splitting up, Phil and Jeff going for the tunnels, while Gordon and Mike are at odds about which way to go. Gordon thinking that he's upstairs, while Mike just gives up, obviously not really even going to look. Phil stops, thinking that he heard something, but Jeff didn't. They come to a ladder leading to a lower area, and afraid Jeff saying that there's no way he's going down there, but there's no stopping Phil. Jeff mentioning the blood that he saw on Hank's hands before he sets off, ordering him to stay put. It's like a puppy dog. Jeff. Stay, boy, stay. Mike has moved on to the final session, session nine, and they turn back to that fateful Christmas night and what Simon did. Billy says Mary was hugging her new doll looking for Peter, but they stopped and yelled that Mary is a good girl and doesn't need to know what Simon did. Phil keeps searching the tunnels, finding Hank's Walkman. While upstairs, Gordon hears a voice calling to him. Phil hears Hank mumbling, what are you doing here over and over to himself, just as the generator gets overheated and loses power throughout the whole building. Jeff runs full sprint to attempt to outrun the darkness, but the lights switch off too quickly, plunging him into black, and Phil discovers Hank huddled in his undies, mumbling to himself. Oddly, Gordon chirps in on the walkie, saying that he's found Hank, despite him being right in front of Phil. Gordon comes back to the wheelchair area, and Phil calls him asking where he is. Up in a ward on the third floor, he says, Phil telling him he's on the way. Mike gets the generator going again, immediately causing the tape recorder to whir to life. It's a crackly man's voice Hello. telling the doctor Hello. Duh. Not just any voice, but the exact same one that Gordon has been hearing, even on the very first day that he set foot into the hospital. The connection between Gordon and Mary now quite clear, as the recording continues and we follow him start to piece things together. The doctor asks if he's Simon, and he coyly replies, you know who I am, and things turn to Christmas night. After some prodding, he reveals the events they've been trying to get out, beginning that Peter was naughty and scared Mary. He crept up behind her and started her, causing her to fall down right on her doll that cut her up real bad. Uh, the scars on her chest, yes? They continue that she needed someone to help her, and that's when he introduced himself and told her to cut up Peter, urging to do it, Mary, and she cut him up real bad. Good thing the knife was brand new, he laughs insanely. Then, just so mom and daddy wouldn't get mad, he told her to cut them up too. So much blood, Simon chuckles, concluding that Mary wanted to do it. Oh boy. Gordon is in Mary's room, the same Phil was in earlier, and he has put up his own photo collage on the wall of his family and friends. And Phil enters looking detached. Meanwhile, Jeff is still losing it and running, screaming like a banshee, and gets his suit off, making it to the van and grabs a walkie. He gets a hold of Gordon, telling him he's in the van. Then hearing footsteps approach, Jeff apologizes for freaking out and gets attacked, I'd wager. In the van, we see the walkie, Phil asking to come back. And it's Gordon that answers, saying he's found the one responsible. Moments later, another car comes barreling up, the new recruit McManus, passing by a bloody handprint on the van door. Gordon passes through plastic sheets while Craig searches for him and the others. Looking over into the next room, there's a big blood stain on the ground, and Gordo comes to a body wrapped in plastic. It's Hank. Phil appears, shrugging him off as a liability. A disturbed Gordon asking who did this. Phil scoffs, Ugh, well he did it to himself. Typical Hank, wrong place at the wrong time. A mortified Gordon thinks Phil is responsible, but he responds that he needs him to wake up and take a really good look, he stresses. Gordon gets a closer look at Hank and removes his shade, seeing a lobotomy needle through his eye, just as Mike described, and the only prescribed cure, wearing sunglasses. Hank being the only one out of the entire group to even have a pair. Phil vanishes as Craig enters asking who he's talking to, confused by the sight. Gordon grabs his neck and takes the pick out of Hank's eye, hearing Simon's in voice encouraging him to do it, and he certainly does, flashing back to Hank in the tunnels. We hear back to Mary's recording, asking Simon why he did it, saying Mary let him dock, they always do he laughs, seeing a dazed Hank down there. And it's Gordon that attacks him with the needle, meaning he was the ominous figure pursuing him. We hear more on the walkie when finding him that Hank is hurt and said Gordon is the one that did it to him. And to prove his point in Mary's room, he also kills Phil, meaning that when we saw Phil with Hank that he was already dead 
either appearing as a ghost or as a manifestation of Gordon's broken mind. Mike is the next to go, taken by surprise in the gym, hearing Phil repeating about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Then finally, Jeff, outside by the van. It looks like his uncle is going in for a supportive hug, but it's the hug of death, young nephew, seeing his body lying there. Gordon now alone, he again hears Phil telling him to open his eyes, to wake up, and remember back to that day at the house with the roses and Oreos and boiling water and everything. This time when we hear the audio, there's no distracting dog barking or baby crying as Gordon excused himself earlier when he was talking to Phil. This time we hear Simon saying to do it, do it now. Hearing sounds that implicate he actually murdered his entire family, Wendy, the dog, and young Emma, pushed to a breaking point by the voice in his head, or rather Simon, hearing him even letting out an anguished no after doing what he did. And then at this point, he disconnected from reality, unable to accept what he did. We go back to him watching the house and back to now enveloped in the plastic sheets, panning over his wall of family photos in Mary's room. He tries to call Wendy, apologizing for what happened, now knowing every time he tried to call Pryor was actually an expression of his guilt and that he never actually spoke to her, you know, being dead and all. <laughs> he laments to being lonely and wants to come home, putting his dirty and bloodied hand on a photo from Emma's christening. Now understanding that it was obviously Gordon that snapped and killed his family and his whole crew, we're treated to one last ominous recording between the doctor and Simon. The doctor asks him where he lives, just as he did with Mary's other personalities. Simon responding that he lives in the weak and the wounded, as the tape continues to crackle. So Gordon definitely did lose his mind, but all the clues along the way leads me to believe that it was actually Simon that pushed him, as he says he lives in the weak and wounded, which from the get-go Gordon fits to a T. He's already nearing the end of his rope and desperate to keep his business going. They're right on the verge of going out of business, as well as struggling to raise a family, all this making him the perfect target for the malicious Simon. Even as soon as he enters the hospital on day one and spots Mary's wheelchair, instantly Simon is able to crack into his fragile mental state, and later that day goad him into killing his family, weak and wounded it indeed. Just like with Mary, he killed her whole family. Now is Simon actually just a part of Gordon's psyche? I'm not so sure. It seems that Simon is more of a malevolent spirit that is now seemingly attached to the hospital and was also previously attached to Mary. He appears not really in control in the one time we see him mid-attack. He's like sleepwalking or in a daze of some kind, and it doesn't look like it's actually him in control, but Simon instead. As Simon takes further control over Gordon's mind, he starts losing touch with reality, hence being told by Phil to wake up. When he finally does, he comes back to reality and only now understands what he's done, all thanks to Simon's influence. In the end, he's left with nothing and has to face the guilt of his actions now that he's back to being normal. Pretty brutal. But hey, I bet he could at least plead a strong case of temporary insanity, so he would end up in a nut house rather than jail, so that's something. That brings us to the conclusion of this in-depth explained video for session nine. I really like this one, especially for how it very cleanly puts out all the pieces of its story together, and is also able to maintain a consistently suspenseful and interesting mystery throughout. Just all around a good one. And if you haven't checked it out and want to for yourself, head on over to Netflix and give it a watch. Many thanks to all you guys out there for requesting this one. And don't forget you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What do you guys think of Session 9 and its ending? What's your interpretation? Was he just nuts or was it supernatural? What's your favorite haunted hospital flick? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.